Thank this you, conference Parani. will I'm... now be recorded. Oh. <clears throat> uh, welcome everyone into my little home here in Cyprus. Uh, this is a case study of a real incident that occurred in the China Sea in January 2018. The collision between the tanker Sanchi and the bulk carrier CF Crystal. The combined flag state investigation report into the collision runs to over 190 pages and it makes for some very sobering and even shocking reading and makes one wonder how such a thing could possibly happen in these days of STCW and ISM code safety management standards. I propose to look at what happened in the hour leading up to the collision and a few minutes after it then perhaps we can come up with some suggestions as to how this could have been prevented. I emphasize from the start that this is not intended to apportion any blame. The purpose of this presentation is to assess what went wrong and offer suggestions as to how the industry can address it from a preventive action perspective. Key details of the two ships. If you're not familiar with condensate, it's a highly flammable liquid with a flash point of minus 40 degrees. Think of high octane gasoline, and in this case, about 115 million liters of it. On the 6th of January, 2018, at 19.50 hours local time, the tanker Sanchi was in collision with the bulk carrier CF Crystal. At the time, the weather was cloudy with good visibility, wind, northeasterly force four to five, and a slight sea state. CF Crystal suffered moderate to serious bow damage and was able to sail to a repair port under her own steam. No crew were injured. Sanchi subsequently sank with the loss of its entire cargo and all 32 crew members. There were no survivors. The investigation draws mostly on the VDR record subsequently salvaged from the wreck of Sanchi and some other vessels that were in the vicinity who had the presence of mind to stop and download their VDR data. On CF Crystal, the crew omitted to stop the VDR, and by the time it was stopped, all data at the time of the incident had been automatically overwritten. No VDR data, so information is taken from interviews with the crew later. So what went wrong, and what lessons can we learn from this tragedy? Nineteen hundred hours. This is the radar picture of Sanchi, heading 342 degrees, speed 10.3 knots. The large echo at the top of the screen is CF Crystal. On board Sanchi, the second officer hands over the watch to the third officer. On CF Crystal, the chief officer is on watch. Fast forward half an hour to 1930 hours. Course is now 357, speed still the same at 10.4 knots. Four echoes on the starboard side, the largest one there being the CF crystal. At that time, 1930 hours, the officer of the watch on Sanchi talked to his AB lookout about targets A and B and assessed that all targets would be passing astern. This is the situation on the two ships at that time. The Sanchi duty officer says on the VDR, recorded on the VDR, BCRR minus, thought to mean bow crossing range of targets A and B. At that time, the CF crystal was about 6.8 miles away. And the under interview, the chief officer of crystal also said that he saw Sanchi about seven miles on his port side.
During the period 1934 to 42 hours, under interview, the chief officer of Sea Crystal said that he'd noticed that the vessel had drifted off to the um, port side of the course line. So he adjusted the course from 217 to 225, that's to starboard, with the intention to go back onto his planned passage. And that adjustment was completed at 1942 hours. When he was asked how he had determined the CPA with Sanchi after he changed course, uh, he said he did not see the Sanchi on the radar. He only knew the other vessel was there by AIS data. And this is the radar image of Sanchi at 1935 hours. Uh, notice that the radar cursor is on the CF crystal and it's bearing 0, 2, 3 and 5.4 miles. Note also the smaller echo on the starboard side. The picture at 1936, not the two targets on the starboard side, the cursor is now on the nearer of the two targets, which is the fishing vessel ZIU 03187. And the triangle symbols of both targets are red with the message AIS collision in the bottom right corner of the screen. At that time, as recorded on the VDR, the fishing vessel ZIU calls Sanchi and asks to pass port to port. And in fact, ZIU makes this call several times over the next few minutes. Moving on three minutes to 1939 hours, both AIS danger targets are still in the red collision warning status. This is the situation on Sanchi as recorded on the VDR. The, the third officer's reaction to the VHF calls made by ZIU. I'll leave you to read it yourselves. I'm not sure exactly what the AB means to say here. He appears to be reminding the third officer that, that he is not complying with the rules, the collision regulations, and he hesitates, then changes his mind. And there were other remarks made in this conversation which were referred to, but not quoted in the investigation report. A couple of minutes later, the situation on Sanchi. The third officer now orders his lookout to signal the fishing vessel with five short flashes, the warning symbol, the international warning symbol. Uh, then at that time, the ZIU realizes that Sanchi is not going to comply and he alters his course to port. At that, that, at that time, the distance to Sea Crystal is about three and a half miles. Note what the Sanchi third officer says. They shall take action because they are smaller vessels. This is the radar picture at 1941 hours. You can just see the ZIU still visible in the clutter down there on the starboard side. Meanwhile, on the bridge of CF Crystal, the third officer comes onto the bridge to take over the watch as scheduled for 20 hundred hours. He has a look at the radar, but sees no echoes, only an AIS symbol. So under interview, he said he thought that it was a fishing vessel because there was no radar echo, only the AIS symbol. 
and this is the radar picture of Sanchi at 1944 hours. ZIU is still just visible in the clutter. His AIS symbol is still red, but passing clear. CF crystal up there is still red and clearly to any navigator is on a collision or at least a close quarter situation course. What's happening on the two vessels at 1945 hours? On CF Crystal, the chief officer took a phone call from the master. He then quickly handed over the watch to the third officer and left the bridge about one minute later. And about the same time, the eight to 12 watch keeping able seamen came onto the bridge and took over as lookout. On Sanji, the, the third officer is still assessing what to do about Sia Crystal, which at that time was about two miles away. Note what the third officer says as recorded on the VDR. What can I do? My starboard side is full. This is the radar picture at that time. His starboard side looks pretty clear to me. Two minutes later, 1948, on, on board the Sanchi. I'll leave you to read the details yourselves, but as you can see, the third officer calls the captain and then he seems to panic. Note his conflicting helm orders and what he says when the captain arrives. And the captain has only time to look out the window and call for harder starboard. At that time on board Sea Crystal, under interview, the duty officer, the third officer, uh, now notices that there's a ship very close, still not aware that she was the Sanchi. He puts on hand steering and orders the able seaman to go to starboard without giving any specific rudder angle order. The AB says that he put the wheel on 20 degrees to starboard. The radar picture of Sanchi at 1948 hours. And at 1949 hours. And finally at 1951 hours. The echo of CF Crystal has now merged with the center spot. The situation on the bridges of the two ships over that few minutes period after the collision. The VDR of Sanchi records the collision at exactly 1950 hours. On Crystal, the master runs onto the bridge, looks at the situation and orders full astern. Only two minutes later, he then orders abandon ship by lifeboat. On board Sanchi, the master immediately orders to start the fire pumps and activate the GMDSS distress signal. Moments later, there's the sounds of an explosion and fire, followed by suffocation sounds, as you might get from all of the air being sucked up into a ball of fire. And at 19.53 hours, the GMDSS signaling stopped. Here are two photographs taken of Sanchi after the collision, uh, taken from a crewman of the Sea Crystal from the lifeboat. And hidden in that ball of fire is a 160,000 tons, 160 meters long ship.
Well, what went wrong? What were the causes? First, we should look at the investigators' findings. And these are the investigators' findings on the part of Sanchi. Direct causes relating to the collision regulations. Rule 5, he failed to keep a proper lookout. Rule 7, he didn't determine that there was a risk of collision. Rule 8, he failed to take any action to avoid collision. And then rules 15 and 16, dealing with the action of the giveaway vessel in a crossing situation, he didn't take any action until it was too late. And the investigators' findings of the direct causes on the part of the CF Crystal. Again, we have rules 5, lookout, rule 7, risk of collision, and rule 8, action to avoid collision. And in this case now we have rule 17, which is the action by the stand-on vessel in a crossing situation. And the officer of the watch failed to take any action to avoid collision. He failed to take any action. Moving on to indirect causes, on the part of Sanchi, they considered that the third officer's attitude was negative. Remember, he expected small vessels such as that fishing vessel to give way, even though under the collision regulations, he was the give way vessel. Before the accident, um, the AB on duty repeatedly reminded the third officer to take action. It's not all recorded in conversations. The third officer, he stayed in the chart room too long, uh, leaving the AB as the sole lookout. They chatted about things that had nothing to do with navigation. And here, number five is a real key point. There were 20 to 25 degrees differences of course over ground and two to three knots differences of speed over ground between the Sanchi's AIS information received by other vessels and the readout of Sanchi's own VDR. And the last point, the third officer had not noticed the change in navigational status of the crystal, the alteration of course to starboard. And the indirect causes on the part of CF Crystal. They hadn't noticed the Sanchi right up to the time of collision. They hadn't seen the flashing signals given by Sanchi. No proper handover had occurred of the watchkeeping personnel. Remember, the chief officer rushed off within a minute or so of the third officer arriving on the bridge. There was improper use of the AIS as a navigational aid, but not actually using it for what it's there for, identifying surrounding vessels. And it had been used as the sole means of collision avoidance. And item six, alteration of course to starboard just 15 minutes prior to the collision. Consider that item six. The course alteration was done very gradually over a period of about eight minutes. Typically, an ARPA takes about six minutes to determine a CPA or TCPA. So this alteration would not have been clearly evident on the ARPA of Sanchi until about 1948 hours. But I'll come back to that point. The investigator's final conclusions. This is what the CF Crystal's flag investigators concluded. The main causal factor, the Sanchi was a giveaway vessel, but did not take any action. And this was the main causal factor. They did acknowledge a secondary causal factor in that CF Crystal should have taken some action under Rule 17, uh, but did not. But anyway, they said, it did not relieve the Sanchi of her obligation to keep out of the way.
The Sanfi flag investigators came to a slightly different conclusion. They concluded that the alteration of course of the Sea of Crystals course to starboard starting 15 minutes prior to the collision developed the situation into a collision which would otherwise have been clear. A few of my own observations which were not recorded on the investigation report. Neither vessel appears to have used the ARPA functions such as setting up guard zones or using the trial maneuver. In fact, it appears that they were not using the ARPA at all. The statements made by the officers of CF Crystal indicate that the radars were either not functioning properly or had been incorrectly set up, such that a very large vessel, the Sanchi, was not visible as a clear target, even only a few miles away. And if you think back to that first slide of the radar picture of the uh, from Sanchi, you could see that the very large echo of the Sia crystal right on the edge of the screen. The Sia crystal officer's statements also indicate that they were simply not looking out of the window. And on both ships, it appears that the lookout was operating the radar, which they were probably not qualified to do, and which could explain why Sanchi was not seen on the screen of Sea Crystal. Perhaps the sea and rain clutters were turned up too high. A final observation on the report. The Sea of Crystal flag investigators analyzed the timeline against the requirements of collision regulation rule seven, which is worth quoting in part. There was a lot more to it than this little piece of information. But they concluded that the CF crystal was first observed by Sanchi at a distance of about 9.8 miles. And it was concluded that risk of collision existed since that time. And since Sanchi had Sea of Crystal on her own starboard side, and risk of collision existed since 1924 hours, then she should have kept out of the way. But Sanchi did not keep out of the way, and so they concluded that was the main contributing factor. However, a fact that was not considered by the Sea of Crystal flag that if risk of collision existed from the time 1924 hours, then from that time, CF Crystal was the stand-on vessel and was equally responsible under Rule 17A1, which I quote, where one of two vessels is to keep out of the way, the other shall keep her course and speed. The risk of collision only developed when Sea Crystal made the series of small alterations of course to starboard into the path of Sanchi between 1934 to 42 hours. And whether the situation at 1924 hours was an impending collision or just a close quarters situation, it's clear that by making the course alteration to starboard at such a critical time placed Sea Crystal in breach of Rule 17A1. I should say that this case is still to be heard before a court and the final judgment is still to come. These observations are my own, based only on the information of the Flag States report. There could be more information made available when it comes before a court. I was not part of the investigation and I cannot presume to declare the root causes of this, but I can raise some questions that go deeper than just what happened in that last hour. Here are the brief profiles of the three officers involved. All of these officers 
held STCW certificates of competency. But were they really competent? We ended the last slide by questioning the competence of the officers on the bridges of the two ships, even though they all held STCW certificates of competency and had all been bridge navigation officers for enough time to be considered experienced. This raises the question, does STCW go far enough to ensure our officers are truly competent? So in the second part of this presentation, I propose to analyze what is meant by competence and then how we as industry managers can assess, measure and improve the competence of our officers. Let's start with what STCW says. The word competence is not defined there, but this is standard of competence and i'll read you leave you to read the details of it but i've emphasized in bold three words there knowledge understanding and demonstrated skill taking the words in bold we can come up with a simple equation competence equals knowledge plus understanding, plus skill. And to be very clear on what we mean, I've taken the definitions of those three words from the Oxford English Dictionary. Under skill, I've emphasized the word well to highlight the level of competence of our three officers. Their certificates declared that they were competent, but I think it is clear that they did not do their jobs well. Otherwise, that collision would not have happened. Here's another definition. The OCIMF information paper, Behavioral Competency Assessment and Verification, which they published in 2018, provides this definition of competency. And again, I've emphasized the word behavior. Competence. Seaways magazine is a very useful source of information and opinion. And if you do not read it regularly, then I recommend that you should. Captain Ivo Dutrovich discusses the subject of competence in the October 2019 edition of Seaways, where he starts with the equation we looked at on the previous slide, but he expands it further with this equation. Now we have to consider one more keyword, attitude. The way one behaves can define how well we do the job. This also takes us back to the OCIMF definition of competency we just looked at. A person's behavior is a function of their attitude. I would like to expand on this hypothesis. I would like to propose this equation. Note that I go so far as to suggest that attitude is squared in the equation. A small improvement in attitude can lead to a big improvement in competence in the sense of doing the job well. Think of it this way. Each of the key points has a value of one. So in this case, competence has a value of three. Now increase attitude to two. Competence now has a value of 12. Increase attitude to three. Competence is now 27 and so on. Of course, this is just a very simplified illustration, but I think it makes a strong point. 
The officers on the two ships that we've just been looking at were qualified as required by STCW, but they clearly had an inadequate attitude. STCW provides us with the first three through onboard training, mandatory shore-based training, and study leading up to written examinations. These are our hard skills or technical skills. But how do we ensure our officers have the right soft skills? Going back to the OCIMF information paper we just looked at, we can find this definition of a soft skill. An attitude and behavior are examples of soft skills. I started this part of the presentation by asking the question, how can we assess, measure, and improve the competence of our officers? And then ensure that they continue to maintain the required level of competence. Here are a few things that we can do. Onboard training, mentoring. Yes, it does have its benefits. But if the able seaman on board Sanchi was a new officer cadet under training, the actions and statements of his training officer, the third officer, might have set him off on the wrong track, assuming that the collision didn't happen. Navigation audits. Yes, this also has its benefits, but perhaps the officer being audited being well aware of the presence of the auditor, will adjust his behavior to the situation and then revert as soon as the auditor has gone. The VDR, going back to Seaways, the November 2019 edition, there was an article written by Captain Deepinder Singh. And he arranged for the responsible superintendent to send instructions to him at random intervals to download the VDR backup and send it for review. Now the officers were being company audited, but without the presence of the auditor or knowing when the audit would or had taken place. And th this is not an entirely new idea and was first actually, actually suggested by OCIMF in their information paper recommendations on the proactive use of VDR information, which was first published as long ago as 2012, revised in 2013, and again just this year in August of 2020. But this falls short of assessing how they react under extreme situations, which only has to happen once in an officer's career. He then either reacts positively or not, such as in the case of our third officer on Sanchi. How can we be sure that he will instinctively react positively under pressure? Simulator training. This has been around now for well over 20 years, but it is still not compulsory under SDCW. For example, in section A1, 6.4.3, it says, if conducting training using a simulator, and there are other references. However, they are an excellent way to hone skills that are not regularly used at sea, and in particular, in emergency situations. Psychometric assessments. I'll simply refer you to the TMSA 3 at KPI 3.4.1, which asks if documented procedures for assessing crew competency include psychometric assessments. And incidentally, that KPI also asks if scenario based simulator assessments are also done. It's not for me to conclude with some sweeping recommendations for change, but I would like to leave you with a few thoughts. 
SDCW does not include soft skills, such as attributes of behavior and attitude in assessments of an officer's competence, such as could be revealed in a psychometric assessment. Should it? SDCW does not require an officer candidate to demonstrate competence by practical assessments, such as could be determined on a bridge simulator. Should it? Other questions. Should IMO be directly responsible for carrying out investigations into very serious marine casualties to avoid flag states, conflicts of interest or disagreements? Alternatively, should IMO delegate a third party flag to carry out such an investigation? And a final comment. The VDR is a very useful auditing tool, which could be better used in the industry. If you want to do some of your own research, here are the references that I've used for this presentation. Well, that's all I have time for. Sorry, we've had to rush it a bit. It's a big subject and we are rather limited on time. It's actually a condensed version of a 90 minute lecture that I have prepared on this subject. If you have any questions on this presentation, please use the comments box and we will try to answer as many as we can at the end. And I'll pass you back now to Captain Parani. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, it's it's a very enlightening presentation, and we have questions pouring in, but we'll save it for the Q and A session after Cuba's uh, presentation. Now, uh, coming to the uh, uh, you know uh, there are a lot of things to unpack in there, but you know I'm just wondering and. Uh, I think everyone can agree that uh, if the accident had happened in Chinese waters, I think there would be many more complications. Uh, for example, uh, uh, criminal uh, liability, there would be a few people going to jail. And I think, you know, with this thought, uh, we can ask Kuba to pick it up and share his thoughts on how such a thing would have proceeded and how the nautical institute can assist in such situations uh, uh, one of the distinct memberships of uh, distinct uh, benefits of the nautical institute membership is the criminal liability insurance and kuba if you could please talk us through that yes thank you being very concerned about the time obviously michael took as predicted by myself far more than Michael was allocated. So I will only speak for one minute. Thank you, Michael. Um, yes, Nautical Institute is probably the only organization in the world at the moment providing members with liability insurance. Why do we need that? Now, guys, I will cut through the cheese. We are in Cyprus. So this accident, we can obviously blame everybody on board and so on and so forth. But I would like you to think about it. How would you react if it was your ship? Would you ask yourself a question? How come that this third officer was allowed to be on board? How come that we allowed and promoted this chief officer to be on board? When did I go on board last time? And so on and so forth. Because if we were to say that this accident happened only because these guys were on board, then I think we are missing big style here. We need to start asking ourselves. That's my comments to, to, to Michael presentation. Now, coming to the liability. And um, we've got a huge conflict of interest, ladies and gentlemen, and that's very interesting because until some time in our lives, yours and mine, we were at sea, we were masters or chief engineers. And when we were on board, we were under influence of PI Club. We thought that PI Club will go on board and will always dig us out of the situation. But now, when you are sitting in office, you are seeing a different story. Very often, if I were to take Captain Lasota case, or very recently 
in Mauricio's case, when the tanker, uh, sorry, Valkyrie ran aground there, what do we see? We see the big, big difference. We see the conflict of interest. All of a sudden, individual master is not necessarily in the same books with PI Club. Now, what would you do if you were a Captain Lasota who found drugs in his ship? Wouldn't you report everything? Of course you would. What would happen then? Well, in Lasota's case, it's 16 months in jail now, in the Mexican jail. And you guys in Cyprus know that very, very well. So where do we, shipmasters, stand when it comes to the collision or any other criminal act as it appears to be treated by the world? Do we have a legal representation? Where can we get money for? Now, any director ashore would have a director and officer's insurance. If you think about shipmaster and go back to your own company and check, What's the difference in contract for shipmaster and AB, liability-wise? There is absolutely no difference for a man who is responsible for all his people on board, cargo, environment, reputation. He is not covered by anything. And if it wasn't for Nautical Institute, the only association organization which provides cover for members, there would be absolutely no one. I think as a members of Nautical Institute, we should really spare a second whenever we are visiting ships and advise our colleagues at sea to reach out and get the Nautical Institute membership. That's all I have time for. I used four minutes of my time, so I stepped down. I have no idea how we are going to pack all these questions from 40 people coming now in next six minutes. But hey, here we go. Over to you, Aran. Thank you, Kuba. Uh, well, you know, I'm going to, uh, you know, just throw it out there. Uh, if, you know, if the participants don't have any objection, then we could carry on for, uh, let's say, five to ten minutes more to take in some of the questions. You know, some uh, I always love this Q and A part. That's where some real interesting stuff comes out. So. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, so stay on, but if you, you know, once we go past the time, then, you know, and you have other commitments, uh, please feel free to leave, but we'll go on for about five, ten minutes more. So uh, the first question, just to, uh, you know, carry on from Kuba's presentation, uh, what exactly is this uh, Kawa Kuba, uh, you know, for the benefits of our participants, uh, you know, what, uh, let, let's say the, if the master of the Sanchi had survived and he was put in jail for criminal negligent or negligent navigation, what, uh, how would he be then supported by the Nautical Institute? Yes, so Nautical Institute would provide a legal support for him. There would be money paid towards his legal representation, which at the moment otherwise would be organized by PNI Club. And uh, in, as it is at the moment, that would be the same um, lawyers representing owners and representing individual. Now imagine any of those cases, but the very good case I can imagine is Casta Concordia, where everything was blamed on shipmaster. And in here, I would imagine that it would be the same. In both cases, in both master's cases, it would be the same when the master would feel probably completely left alone. Now, with cover from Nautical Institute, he would have a team of lawyers representing him. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kuba. Uh, but by the way, is there a limit to how much assistance can we can get from this cover? Sorry. Uh, is there a limit? I mean, is there some sort of limit to the uh, cover? I'm trying to... Uh, let's say the... Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Okay, good. £50,000 is the limit for the cover 
for the uh, legal costs. Okay. Thank you, Kuba. So, uh, if uh, I think we may uh, circle back to you in case there are questions, uh, specific <laughs> questions addressed to you, but I'll uh, move on to the Q&A session. We have some questions. I have put some of them on this slide and some of them I have taken notes. So the first question, uh, Michael, uh, is this is for you. Do you, uh, you know, from the investigation report, does it say if the master standing orders were posted? Uh, yes, in, in the report, the, the investigators, ob obviously what I, uh, in my presentation is, is very, uh, much a condensed version of what was in the investigation report. Yes, the masters did have their standing orders posted up, but it's not just a matter of posting up your orders if nobody complies with them. Um, so I, I believe that they did have their um, orders posted. The, the any information related to rest hours, yes, the, the, the report does investigate that and there was no um, there was no question that, that anybody was overly fatigued. In fact, it doesn't actually say it in the investigation report, but the, uh, the Sanshi appears to have had four mates uh, because the, part of the reason why the third officer was uh, spending time in the chart room, because he was chatting to the extra second mate. So there were two second mates, a third mate and the chief officer and standard officers on the bulk carrier, but, but there was no concern about rest hours. Okay, thank you. And this question is as for you as well. Uh, yes, uh, yes, well, that, that kind of uh, uh, detail would uh, prove the condition of the equipment. The uh, investigation report doesn't go that deeply into it. As, as you noticed, some of the my own observations were even not recorded in the investigation report. Okay. Um, and uh, okay, this this is a question about the leadership styles of the masters, and uh, you made a reference to the soft skills as well. Uh, Kuba did as well, so. Uh, would you want to comment on this? Well, yeah, we can we can consider that leadership styles of the masters certainly do uh, um, can can have some problems. Uh, there's not really anything that um, that comes to the front in in this investigation report regarding the two masters. Um, I, you know, we don't really have a lot of time to discuss this here, but I do point out or note that the master of the um, CF Crystal uh, took barely two minutes to decide to abandon ship, uh, leaving a, a big ship with a fully functioning engine room to get his crew into a little lifeboat. Uh, as for the master of the Sanchi, well, the third officer did call him. He did feel free to call the master. He just left it too late. There's okay. There's a question. You know, there's a finding in the report. That the AIS was used on the CF Crystal as a sole means of collision avoidance. But uh, there's a lot of uh, you know. There are many reports from navigation audits that this seems to be the common practice. So, would you want to comment on that? Uh, well, yeah. It, if it's becoming a common practice, because remember, AIS has only been around for what ten years or something. Uh, and people are now starting to think that this, uh, what, what they're seeing on the AIS is um, a substitute for the radar or even for the Mark I eyeball. So uh, note that one of the findings, what, there was a huge error in the AIS information from the Sanchi. So this will uh, just raises the point that you should not use AIS for collision avoidance. It's there for information. Um, AIS was used on board CF Crystal as the sole means of collision avoidance. It was, that's what came out in the report. What was not really investigated 
to my mind, properly in the report was why the radar records were not showing clearly on the radar. It, it's not it's not covered in the report at all. But it seems to me that they were just not controlling their radars properly, or something was wrong with them. But if they had two radars, then surely both of them can't be have the same fault. And this. I think we may have time for one last question, Michael. And uh, this is from me. Uh, right. There was a yeah. There was a safety bulletin from the Okimp. Um, I think many of you might have seen it, and uh, it specifically talks about the Sanchi and the CF Crystal, and it asks SIRE inspectors to ask detailed questions. Uh, especially in chapter four of the VIQ. Uh, so, uh, Michael, do you want to kind of give us some examples of what kind of questions, you know, uh, you have you have the background of a SIRE inspector, so what kind of yeah, uh, questions we'll be on the point asked? now. Actually, the, the, the new VIQ, VIQ7, has a lot of changes in the way that the inspector is required to approach his inspection. There are many more questions that um, start with are crew members aware of or uh, do crew members know about uh, uh, there's more emphasis on software the crew rather than the hardware uh, rust and and, uh, and functioning systems such as that so the uh, in the last two or three years the um, uh, vetting inspectors have been and will continue to be um, looking more closely at the the attitude of the officers it's it's a matter of phrasing your questions um, to see if they're aware of, of how such equipment is used you can ask them uh, how do you uh, what's your primary collision avoidance can you show me how you've set your ais ask for various questions on the ectis because we've seen so many incidents in the last few years with you could call them ECDIS assisted uh, incidents where ships have run aground because the uh, the depth contours have not been properly set and so on um, so it's difficult for me to ask a question as if you were the navigating officer it's really just a matter of assessing the situation when you are there and then asking the questions it's something you build up by experience of dealing with people okay uh, thank you Michael uh, we have some more questions, but uh, unfortunately, for the benefit of time uh, for everyone, uh, I'm sure it's dinner time for many. So we'll stop here for today. We'll look at your questions and see if we can get get back to you on them, or we can do something uh, you know with it in a in a in a later event. Uh, so now, uh, I think my role is uh, coming to an end. I'll pass on. Uh, for the closing to you on but before uh, going a uh, big thank you from from my end to Michael and to Cuba for their time and this wonderful presentation over to you you on before we go Parani I've just noticed Neil Hawks has put a, pre uh, a question up one final question on that I'm yet to witness the third officer being questioned on navigational issues well then Neil should have attended an inspection with me because I very often question third officers as well as second officers, sometimes even cadets. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah, um, uh, I think that's a good question and a good response. So. Uh, you on? I'll hand over the uh, uh, you know the proceedings to you. Thank you, Captain Parani. Excellent on such a tragic situation. It obviously did take longer than anticipated, but from my perspective, it was truly worthwhile, and the audience retention was great. Just to reflect, you know, whilst the news uh, that United Nations has passed a resolution urging member states to de designate seafarers and other marine personnel as key workers. Obviously, this is good news, 
through COVID-19, now 20 and probably into 21. And the actions of global regulators, associations, other maritime bodies advocating change to acknowledge and facilitate crew changes, my mind, um, it wonders to see fair mental wellness, fatigue, competency, training, all of which uh, potentially being an ever-present contributing factor to an increase in marine accidents and incidents. So emphasis should therefore also continuously be given to the evolution of engaged training, whether it be at an academy, mentoring on board or ashore, um, or over the last couple of years through the attractiveness of virtual or simulated reality training. And especially when a new generation of seamen and women um, embrace tech to build on their skills and confidence and improvement of language barriers Opportunities are available for our seafarers to prepare them for situations that could arise via the beauty of technology, AR or VR, in our ever-progressing digital world, giving them the chance and ability for them to actually practice adept tasks in a safe environment that we all know could very well become real-life situations making their jobs, lives at sea, vessels and cargo safer. Even if culture change is warranted, to ensure these key workers are experienced, appropriately trained, competent by demonstrated skill and rested properly. Corporate culture should be a key component, component in organizations as it does have a direct impact and commitment is important to foster from the top on board and ashore. Servicing functionality and proper training for all equipment on board is essential. I mean, this statement is self-explanatory. But lastly, I would like to make a couple of points um one hopefully all countries governments associations stakeholders within the global maritime arena will continue to play their important role and exercise continuous collective efforts to enable stranded seafarers to return home perhaps even for christmas to be with their loved ones if you're interested in reaping the benefits of being a member of the Nautical Institute, as highlighted this evening, please do surf our branch website or Nautical Institute headquarters site for further info. Do tune in to a live streaming virtual debate via the Shipping Deputy Ministries website and social media platforms taking place next Monday the 7th at 1500 hours GMT. It will be addressing ETS in shipping, elixir or threat to sustainability, an issue shaping the future of our industry, which is actually open to the public. And fourth, stay tuned, of course, to our news of upcoming Nautical Institute Cyprus branch webinars and our activities. Lastly, esteemed presenters, audience, committee, Nautical Institute headquarters, thank you so very much. Wishing you a good evening till next time. Please do stay safe, stay well, stay protected. Thank you very much. <laughs>